My name is Jennifer and my husband and I began our adoption journey in 2005. We um, decided that was how we wanted to grow our family. We didn't necessarily need to adopt, but we wanted to. My mother grew up playing on the grounds of Pearl S. Buck International um, when it was Ms. Buck's home. And my grandfather was a local sheriff, so he was friends with James Michener and um, Pearl Buck. And my mother grew up playing with some of the first children that were ever brought to Welcome House for adoption. And when we decided that we wanted to adopt, we decided that this was the place we were going to come because of our family history. So when we got our paperwork and started filling out all of our paperwork, we started looking at the sheet that comes in the packet about um, if you would be willing to accept certain conditions with a child. And as we were filling out, we decided we could accept this. We could accept this, and ultimately we did want a healthy child, but as we examined the paper, we thought, well, we could accept these issues and those issues, and we actually checked off quite a few things. And we began our process of waiting and preparing for our child, and we knew that most likely from Korea that it was going to be a boy, so we began buying boy things. And one day in the newsletter in November of 2006, I saw a picture of a little boy. And he was this beautiful little boy with this big smile. And we decided that we wanted more information about this beautiful little boy. So we contacted Welcome House, and he had huge issues, so many issues. And they told us that they were waiting for more information for him. So that was November of 2006, and on December 22nd, I believe, of 2006, Nancy Marshall, the career program director, called us and said she had more information. And our dear little boy had congenital syphilis and bronchiopulmonary dysplasia, which is lung disease. He had congenital pneumonia. He was born severely prematurely with an APGAR of 1. He was intubated for 32 days on oxygen. He was on IV antibiotics for 21 days. He was in the NICU for three months and um, had some very, very serious medical issues. So we consulted with our own pediatrician and with Children's Hospital Philadelphia's International Adoption Health Unit. and. By December 24th, we had decided that um, we were very interested in adopting him. So we did request some more information, and by January, we accepted his referral. And given all of his many health problems, when he arrived home, he was a beautiful little boy. And the only thing he had to show in the end was asthma. And to this day, he does have viral-induced asthma. But he is a healthy seven-year-old who's very happy and very well-adjusted. And he's an artist. And he sculpts with clay. And he draws. And he's actually going to have a piece of artwork um, in the James Michener Museum for Art um, from his school. So he's very excited about that. So because our first experience was so wonderful, we decided that we wanted to adopt another child. So we decided to go down the route of Korea again, and we decided that we would be open to pretty much anything. And once again, um, we saw, when I was reading the Korea program update, I saw information about a little boy that it seemed that nobody was interested in adopting. And ironically, my grandmother died on February 16th of 2010, and Welcome House received his referral on February 17th of 2010, and I saw his, his initial story a couple of days later. And he was referred as a healthy child, but he was born with wet lungs and torticollis, which is a muscle condition, and he had some physical therapy, but the first family that saw his referral um, declined him, saying that he um, should be a waiting child. So Welcome House relisted him as a waiting child, and when I saw his story, something just clicked. And my husband said, well, let's have some more information. So we did. And we dealt with um, Amy, the career program director, and she sent us some great information. And once again, we chose to deal with Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and they referred all of his information to them. And we brought him home, and he appeared to be perfectly healthy in the beginning. And we went down the same route of early intervention services and um, an evaluation at Children's Hospital, and he had some, some skills that were very scattered and some things that didn't quite make sense. And we continued with early intervention, and he had physical therapy, he had occupational therapy, he had speech therapy, and he had a special instructor. And he had, once again, continued with some very scattered skills, and 
He ended up with pneumonia several times, and he ended up with an RSV infection and was hospitalized. And our pediatrician started thinking that, you know, something just wasn't quite making sense to her. So she began testing him for immune diseases and autoimmune deficiency diseases. And eventually we did end up at infectious diseases at Children's Hospital, and nobody could quite pinpoint what was going on. And his symptoms were still very scattered. He wasn't walking, um, and he was almost two, and he wasn't really speaking. And we persevered and continued on, and um, they began testing for genetic issues. And there was one genetic syndrome that they really felt um, that he may have, so of course we studied it and thought, okay. And um, one Saturday morning, our pediatrician called me and said, um, about a month after his genetic testing, said, well, I would really like you to come into the office and talk with me. And I said, oh, well, that's probably not good. And she said, well, we just need to talk for a little bit. And I remember thinking, okay, and you know, as much as you prepare for something and you accept that something is going to happen, you eventually think to yourself, well, I need a moment to recoup. And I said to her, okay. And I said, I just have two questions. And she said, okay. And this was always the hardest part for me. I said, is he going to die and is he going to be happy? And she said, no and yes. And I thought, okay. So I went into the office and our pediatrician is absolutely wonderful. And she proceeded to show me a medical book that described to me a syndrome called 5P deletion. And basically, our son Joan is missing the fifth, um, the short arm of his fifth chromosome. And it is an incredibly devastating condition. And the first thing that strikes you when you read the literature is in big bold print in all of the books is severe mental retardation. And I work in childcare and we no longer use those terms to describe children who are differently abled. Um, we use the term developmentally delayed or developmentally disabled or children who are differently abled. But with this particular syndrome, they do still use this term, which is very severe. And in that moment, everything changes. And I went about my normal business that day and looked at him and thought, well, that's not you. And it really wasn't him. And we continued with our therapies and all of his therapists agreed that's not him. And we made our appointment with the genetic counselor at Children's Hospital. They're a wonderful resource that every family should use. And we had our appointment about two months after his diagnosis, which was a very, very long, very hard wait to um, see the genetic mapping and to hear what the geneticist felt about his syndrome and how he, his, the syndrome applied to him. And in the meantime, our family was very supportive and our friends were very supportive. And we used our therapists as a great resource and they all agreed that, you know, the syndrome didn't necessarily fit Jonah because most children are diagnosed at birth with his syndrome and he wasn't. Um, and by the time we met with the geneticist, she was very encouraging and said that he's very atypical for his syndrome and he has some traits of the syndrome and some he doesn't. Um, and in that moment you have more hope, but there is a shift and your life is one thing before and you think your life is going to dramatically change, but it's more of a growing process and it's more of a changing and just changing sometimes the way you see things and modifying the way you look at things. And I was never so bold as to presume what my children would be when they would grow up. Um, I never said AJ is going to be a lawyer and Joan is going to be a stockbroker. Um, I just had this very happy plan for them that they were going to have a wonderful childhood and have everything they needed. They were going to go to college. They were going to have a wonderful career. They were going to get married and have wonderful families. And then my, my end goal for them was to grow old on a golf course looking over the ocean with their grandchildren playing around them. And that was the main goal I had for my children. And with Jonah, the hardest part was letting go of that vision of what his life, what his happy life should be. And modifying my view of his happy life. And in the end, I realized that his life can be happy no matter what his life is. And as his mother, it's my job to make him happy. And in the end, he is a beautiful, happy little boy who is very well adjusted, who loves going to school, loves his friends. And where we do face challenges, um, 
The main challenge is that he is not able to communicate traditionally. He, his language is severely delayed, but he is presumed to have a normal IQ and his receptive language is 100%. He understands everything you say to him. He can follow three step related commands. He um, loves books, loves children, loves playing, loves fire trucks, loves tractors. Um, he loves to draw with his brother. And the only challenge that we face on a daily basis is communication. And whereas he does have some language and some signs that his children with his syndrome typically do not have, um, it is a little more difficult figuring out. Um, Jonah can answer yes and no questions, and but can't give you the verbiage behind his responses. So when he's sick, it's a little harder um, with just answering yes and no, but your life modifies on a daily basis and you think your life will dramatically change and that you know, bringing a child that has special needs into your home will change everything. And in essence, it changed a few things. It changed um, the way we communicate a little bit more. It changed the way our family functions a little bit. Um, but it was really just like having a child. And whether you add a child who's special needs or a child who's perfectly healthy, your family is going to grow and change. And whether you add a pet to your family or, you know, Families change on a daily basis, and they grow, and they modify, and life is a journey, whether it's an adoption journey or any kind of journey. So, I guess that's it.